So let's get straight into the conversation, and I'll start, allow me to start with you, William Ngeno, by virtue of the fact that you are one who is directly involved, when you're talking about, you know, land preparation, uh, in terms of getting food on our tables, we start from somewhere. And uh, maybe start with your opening remarks, but as you do that, maybe just also enlighten us on the question of land. Are we uh, land secure? Do we have enough land as a country uh, to grow food that would you know, supply us enough? And what are some of the risks and policies that possibly we need to have in place so that that land is secure, but particularly uh, arable land? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a pivotal moment that this conversation is um, happening. Because when we look at the land issue in Kenya, for that case, only 16% of the land mass is arable. If we look at our neighborhood, Tanzania, for example, they're talking about 44 million hectares of arable land. What does this tell us? We have a challenge because in Africa, we have the most uh, prevalent uh, areas in smallholder farms. So the key issues is that we have to produce more food for the growing population while the resources are fast declining. The national average production makes us in Kenya a net importer of food. Case in point, maize. We're talking about one million tons plus deficit in terms of maize production. So we need to satisfy that demand with only 16% of our land being arable. Now, I want to bring in context the external factors that affects production as well. Talk about the weather. This weather and the pests, we know all about the locusts that is happening now. So this also puts in more pressure into our food productivity. What we are working around is to find solutions. We in Yara, we want to responsibly feed the world. So looking at the growing population, where we will bust 9, million, nine billion uh, population in the world. We've calibrated the soils. We've come up with tailor-made fertilizer solutions that enable the growers to build in, in their crop production systems, affordable fertilizer regimes that ensures that it's not acidifying to the soils, but optimizes the production. So the key word that we need to work around in the country is efficiency. We need to look at the return on investment by the smallholder farmer so that we can fast track, increase our productivity. I'll give you an example. In an acre, average production is about, in maize, which is a key crop. Of course, it's all over 90% of the food in the table every day in Kenya. So average farmer produces 15 bucks of maize per acre. With calibrated good fertilizer regimes, you can take that to 25 bucks per acre at the same cost of production. So this is the kind of approach in technology through good technology in seed, fertilizer, machinery definitely, and all the good agricultural practices mm -hmm. so that we can be able to drive this productivity. And this is our mission in Yara. If you look around the background of uh, the, 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 the land productivity, I want to highlight one thing about the land, because it's not only a question about the available land. If we look deeply in the quality of the land, more than 40% of our soils is acidic. More than 80% of our soils is deficient in sulfur. Now, the law of minimum tells us you can never achieve the yield potential. If we get a seed variety that has a potential of about 14 tons per hectare of maize, for example, 
without meeting this law of minimum, eliminating and providing the correct balanced nutrition. We, the farmer cannot achieve any potential from that seed variety. Uh, allow me to interrupt you yes. there because uh, you've brought in the question and aspect of seed. And I'd like Mr. Azaria maybe to respond on that, given that we already have that knowledge of uh, the kind of land that we have and the acidity levels or the pH levels. Um, where does that leave us when it comes to now looking for the right seed, Mr. Azaria? Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, when it comes to the seed, uh, we know that seed is the most important uh, agricultural input in the sense that farmers are in various uh, agroecological agro agro zones. We have, like has been said, we only have about 16% of uh, productive arable land. And therefore, it means we need to maximize on productivity in those areas. Varieties are bred to suit specific zones. That means when we go to the highlands, we need varieties that can, we can actually maximize output from those areas. So it means, therefore, a seed needs to be produced and planted in the right zone so that we can get the 14 tons per hectare that is required. Um, in Kenya, we have varieties for the highlands, for instance, and that's where we get a lot of production. And um, the, the varieties that have been bred by companies like Kenya Seed and other institutions like Calro have potential of producing up to maybe, let me use what is understood clearly in Kenya is number of bags. How many bags can you get per acre? In Kenya, we can get, we have varieties that can produce up to 56 bags, like the varieties that Kenya Seed have bred, 52 to 56 bags per acre. But you can see the national average is about, um, it's about 15. So what is the problem? Where is the deficit? It's all about several other factors. Um, when you look at the soil management, land preparation is something that contributes to that yield. If we do not prepare land adequately using the right machinery, then you end up with a poor seedbed. Therefore, the seedling development is poor and the ultimate product will be low. Mm. If you also get the wrong variety in the, in the wrong area, for instance, if you've planted early maturing or the dryland varieties in the highlands, what will happen is, yes, you'll have a, a variety that will grow, I mean, that plant will grow, but it will not perform because it is not meant for that area. Or you take a variety meant for the highlands, and put it in the medium altitude areas or in the dryland areas, you will not get the yield that is desired. So the issue is we need to have a balance, get the right variety for the right place, do the right preparation in terms of land preparation, and then apply also the right amount of fertilizer. Mm. And before all this is done, I think we have to get it right from the beginning, is get to understand your soil. What is the pH of that soil? An ideal pH range for, uh, for agricultural production is 5.8 to 6.8. That is a pH that where you get the crops doing very well. In other words, the nutrients in the soil are available. So when you look at the key nutrients that are required by the plants to be able to yield well, we have the nitrogen, we have the, the, the phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. Those are the key ones. Of course, we have calcium, magnesium, and also sulfur that are very essential for plant growth. Mm. So once you understand the soil and you have done the soil testing, then you will know what levels of fertilizer to apply. And also know availability of some of these nutrients in the soil. If the nutrients are there but not available because this is locked by, because of acidity, then you won't, you won't be able to, the plants will not be able to extract those nutrients. And, and, so, and are you satisfied with the research that uh, is going on so far in getting this information, and more importantly, to get this information to the farmer? Because I wonder how many farmers uh, grow crops 
purely because they found their grandparents growing those crops, and maybe that land is no longer you know, viable for those kind of crops. Are you satisfied with the, with the research that is being done? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, many farmers have really do not have uh, adequate information. That's why we say we need to sensitize farmers. Farmers grow year in, year out. They plant maize in the same place. So this continuous cropping, what you call monocropping, it depletes the soil nutrients. So there's need to sensitize farmers. We used to have a program by the Minister of Agriculture on uh, training and visiting, where we had an extension, a very robust extension system, where farmers would be brought together, farmer or farmer field schools, and they are trained on all these aspects of soil management and uh, crop management, be able to understand what they should plant, where, when, what kind of fertilizer to apply. So I think there's need now to uh, come up with a program to sensitize farmers on some of these aspects of crop production. And now that agriculture is devolved, that there is also need to build capacity in the counties so that farmers uh, can have access to technical information, mm -hmm. that they can be advised on what to plant, what fertilizer regimes to apply, what varieties to plant, okay. and expected yield, so that they go towards a specific target. They need to know if it is maize, what is the potential? 56 bucks? Yes. What should I do to do that? There's plant population, the right variety, the right amount of fertilizer to apply, and also other agronomic aspects like weed control. If you don't control your weeds within the first uh, 30 days, there is indication that you lose about 30 to 40 percent of your potential yield. All right, thank you very much. Let me come to you, Fergus Robley, on uh, farm mechanization and whether there is an uptick of technology. Of course, if we're talking about efficiency, if we're talking about getting the right uh, tools and equipment, are we there? Are we heading there? And what needs to be done? Okay, I think we, we've heard about. Uh food security and sustainability, challenges with land, um, and the, the previous uh, two questions have all come down to, we've got a limited amount of soil and uh, we need to condition it. Uh, soil acidity has been mentioned, which is a, a key problem. Um, I think we, we've basically got to go back to the basics and what, what is farming? I mean, the farming is food production. And food production is the most important, uh, um, most important uh, profession to, to sustain human life, okay? Um, and what are we trying to do with farming? We're trying to get one seed to produce more than anything else. So we've got to make sure that we understand a plant. And if we look at a plant, um, we need to make sure that we're not, when we're farming, putting in yield-limiting factors. We've heard of uh, 47, 50, sorry, 57 bags uh, an acre from seed. That is the yield potential. Um, but if we ignore the soil acidity, um, if we ignore things like uh, plant population, if we ignore fertilizer, if we ignore calibration, we're actually, as, as farmers, or as us as machinery suppliers, um, not disseminating the correct information to, 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 to the farmers. And, and uh, we, we have a, uh, in the private sector, we have a responsibility for doing that mm -hmm. so that the farmers can get more on a restricted amount of land. So it's okay. a more for less approach. Right. And, and do you think the challenge is more of the information getting to the farmer? Is it affordability? What do you feel? Because I'm sure every farmer would be very happy to get better yield. I think you touched on it earlier. It, it's sort of paternal knowledge transfer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there wasn't, uh, if we go back in time, the pressure on food production was not as high. With the increased population, we've got greater pressure. Um, we've got our input costs. Um, we, we sort of farm badly and uh, you could still sell the produce at the end and you, you covered your costs. Um, now we've got increased population and uh, we need food. So we need to uh, disseminate the right information to eliminate these factors. 
So, you know, we have been farming with disc plows and disc harrows. Um, and, and this is one of the causes of, of soil acidity because we've actually been creating what is called a mechanical pan at about uh, 8 to 11 inches under the soil. Yet our plants, if we're talking maize, for example, for what's above the ground, if we call that a ratio of 2 to 1, the, the, we've actually got to think about what's below the ground and we've got to encourage the taproot to be able to uh, penetrate the soil and um, grow a really healthy root ball mm -hmm. um, so that it produces uh, three nice cobs and can get close to the 57 bags per acre. But if, if the root ball hits acidity, um, it, number one, the, the, the uh, nutrients won't be available to it to, to produce their yields. But it, it's, it's the farmer's responsibility. If we now think about tines um, and moving to subsoiling so that we actually break through that so that we allow that two to one root shoot ratio to actually work. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of having our root ball going down to sort of six, seven inches, which is the, the norm here, mm -hmm. and our low yields of you know, 15, it's in some places it's even lower, mm -hmm. bags per acre. If we allow the root to go down, and, and as long as we get the secret ingredient, which is rain, right. um, uh, you will get the, the higher yields with the correct seed, the correct fertilizer, mm -hmm. and, and you're allowing that root ball to go so there is, there is a ratio of one below the ground and All two right. above the ground. Okay, uh, let me come to you, Jacob. Uh, practical actions. You talk about ecological agriculture, and what I've heard from the three panelists so far is more to do with technology. We seem to be changing how we do farming, but uh, we must agree that farming, first of all, has faced its fair share of uh, challenges. Look at the weather. Uh, we're in January. It is currently raining, which is something, yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal. How do we go around this? Because these are some uncontrollable uh, environmental things that we, we really have no charge over. Thank you. Um, before I go to um, the latter part of the question, I would wish to speak through the issues of agroecological applications in land preparation, and also uh, join it with uh, the issue of fertility management, right. uh, which uh, uh, my colleagues here have, have talked about. Now, um, when you hear conversations about land and agriculture, there is something that we have to be con cognizant of, that over 70% of agricultural production is smallholder farmer based. And talking about that, uh, we also know that the land holding is continuously decreasing because of population increase and that exerts pressure on land. Now, there is a matter here about land degradation. And this is why uh, for those of us uh, who engage in this space uh, and practical action is engaging here, is because it is one natural capital that if its challenges are not addressed, will really put the future of food security in this country and the region at jeopardy. Um, look at what the economics of land degradation tell us. It tells us that about 1.6 billion Kenya shillings of agricultural value is lost to land degradation. And that has been occasioned by, you know, uh, improper and wrong applications of fertilizers, land management, and, and crop management. Mm -hmm. So if we are saying that 26% of our GDP uh, in this country, for example, comes from uh, agriculture, then we are actually getting that eroded by that aspect of land degradation. So the question is, if that is where we are, what do we do? Um, we talked about land preparation because it starts from there. We can no longer afford to keep disrupting our soils. And our soils, uh, having the fact that about 40% of them are acidic, are losing the functional potency to support food production. So we 
have to apply technologies that do not disrupt our soils. And we say generally to uh, something that is not more than a third of land surface area for smallholder farmers. Because that is where the focus ought to be. Um, and it goes uh, uh, with, with respect to the hard pan that uh, keep getting built up. We believe that mechanization still has a place in sustainable land preparation, except that we, we've got to assume and get into a different paradigm shift in terms of the equipment that we innovate. So innovation is key here. The equipment that we innovate to support smallholder farmers to be in a position to prepare their land and produce food sustainably. Mm. So it's important that we dispel the notion that mechanization only can apply to large-scale farming. And what we need to realize is that as populations increase, that land will be required and inherited for future generations. For future generations. About mm -hmm. seed, briefly. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, seed and seed systems are critical. And what agroecological uh, application here would apply is to be able to have you know, uh, biological associations of you know, plant species that are crop-based to be able to interact among themselves right. so that they can be able to support mm. uh, crop biodiversity. And that goes a long way in breathing new life to our soils that are tired. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll pause you there because I want to bring in Eric. And Eric, agrochemicals obviously are a major part of this whole conversation. Uh, but there's also a lot of myths surrounding that in terms of diseases caused by some of these agrochemicals, whether they actually improve the crop or they have uh, also effects that they have, you know, side effects that we may not be aware of. Maybe speak to this as you enlighten us on that. Okay, thank you. Um, just for the benefit of the viewers and the audience here, is that all of us, we are talking about productivity, improving productivity. And all what the panelists have talked about is contributing to that. However, where we come in as an agrochemical company is to protect the crop. We are, we are designing products to protect the potential yield losses that have been, we are talking about herbicides. Those are one we, we are weeding, 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 weeding products. We have diseases we have insect pests. These have potential of losing up to 100% of your yield, depending on the, where you are. So what we are doing as, a, as an industry, we are providing solutions for you to protect, to improve the yield, for you to get the genetic potential of that. If you do all these parameters that have been done wrongly, then you have an inclination to the yield. So what happens is that we are improving productivity. The other option we have is to chop off all our forests and plant maize or plant seeds. So we are not being ecological. We need to use whatever resources that we have, improve productivity, protect the potential yields from the losses. Remember, pests and beneficial organisms live in equilibrium. They are the same. But why are they pests increasing, increasingly becoming a problem? It is because we are doing intensive agriculture. We are utilizing the smaller resources that we have. There is climate change with us. We are seeing episodes of pests and disease that sometimes we take time to... to, to, to to identify. So it's telling us that the episodes are changing. So we need to change. However much we say we do all these things in terms of understanding the equilibrium. That's why we're talking about sustainability, bringing life. He's talking about bringing life into soil. We are turning up the soil for aeration. Everybody's talking about the seed potential. All these are integrated together to an ecosystem now. Talking about the myths and health concern. The products that are designed for health, and for health I'll talk about, particularly important, the food is for health. First, you have to be healthy, you have to be healthy for you to eat food, so you need food. Through that process of protection, these products, the md for pcpp is here, you'll talk about that, that is their, their role, is that these products are evaluated on risks that are posed to human beings. Not only to human beings, to human beings, to animals, to the environment, to water, to drinking water that even into, into boreholes. So the risk assessment has been done they are approved for use for that particular purpose. So, 
when authorities approve these products, they are giving authority for people to use the products in the same way. They protect us for, and they, through that we have what we call very critical issues that are communicated to farmers. There is the PHI, the time that we're holding period that you need to stay before harvesting the crop. Those ones must be observed. They say the poison is in the dose, so the dose you have to absorb the dose that you apply onto the products you're using. They are recommended that, been tested all over. So once a product has been approved for use in that particular situation, which is clearly labeled on a product label in English and Swahili, it has been approved for use. So that one takes care of uh, the health issues concerned and the environment. Remember, we also have products that are related to malaria. We have malaria in Baringo now. A thousand people have tested positive on malaria. We, all, uh, those products are also tested for safety and are used to control mal uh, the malaria, uh, I mean, the mosquito that transmit malaria and the dengue uh, disease. So we, they are all protected, they are all interrelated, that they have, must be evaluated, they must be tested, and they must be approved by a regulatory, competent regulatory body in each and every country. You go to Ethiopia, it's the same thing. You go to Europe, it's the same thing. You go to, to, to USA, it's the same thing. So they have been tested and been approved for use for that particular purpose. All the studies have been there. So we have discussions surrounding that kind of thing, but for the benefit of the viewers, those products, once approved, are good for use. However, right. if there's any other information that comes into place, then the, the, the competent authorities will sit and make a decision based on the available information. Are we up to date as a country in terms of uh, some of the banned substances? For instance, uh, the likes of methyl bromide, which is apparently very effective in uh, controlling uh, pests and uh, you know, some of those things that would uh, um, spoil the crop in the soil. But when you do your research, we find that there are some countries where it is banned, yet in, Ke in Kenya it's still being used. Oh. Methyl bromide... Uh, uh, That's just uh, an example, but are we yeah. up to date in terms yes, of... Yes, we are up to date, and always the list is updated when products come here. Whenever information is found that this product has an issue, mm -hmm. that must be scientific information. It must be approved by a competent authority. Once it's transmitted here and is agreed upon, it triggers what is called a review process. Mm -hmm. Remember, we are in various jurisdictions. So a product is taken case by case. It could be removed from, uh, let's say, for example, in Europe for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. That place is not there. Probably it could be the water, uh, the, the water table is higher. In Kenya here, probably the water table is different. So it's a situation issue. You look at the risk. That's why there's a risk assessment process. So you, you evaluate each case by case. So whenever information becomes available through a competent authority, not just any information from the public you pick and say this issue has been found and it's been agreed upon, it will trigger a review process locally here and say, in our situation, is this relevant? Do we have alternatives? What are the measures that we're going to take against this? How are we going to manage this? Those questions are constantly asked. As an industry, we have lost quite a number of products through that kind of evaluation, right. and we have agreed and they've been removed from the list for use, or they have been restricted for use, and sometimes even banned for use. From, from use. So uh, the, the list is updated based on the information mm -hmm. that is as scientific data that is approved by any other regulatory board.